groups. For example, it affects one out of every 260 black or African-American births, compared to one out of every 10,209 white births and one out of every 2,714 Hispanic American births. Furthermore, per the report, approximately 80% of individuals diagnosed with SCD in New York um, State lived in New York City, while 76% of newborns with SCD were born right here in our city. In New York State, the rate of SCD among black residents is nearly 10 times higher than the rate among white residents. And in New York City, the rate of SCD among black residents is nearly 15 times higher than the rate among white residents. Given the complexity of the disease, costs, and scarce specialized care, tragically, many who suffer from SCD do not live to see an age that most of us would consider the prime life, prime of life. In New York State, only 14% of individuals diagnosed with SCD live past the age of 51 years, underscoring the urgent need for intervention and support. Despite this alarming statistics, sickle cell research and support services remain disproportionately underfunded compared to other chronic diseases. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute spend only 77 million annually on sickle cell research. Meanwhile, rare diseases such as cystic fibrosis receive 11 times more per person funding from the National Institute of Health. The national spending of cystic fibrosis was 440 times that of SCD. And cystic fibrosis had more than twice as many peer-reviewed um, publications than SCD. This is a blatant injustice. Sickle cell patients face accelerating pain unbearable, frequent hospitalization, and a shortened life expectancy. Yet, they continue to be overlooked when it comes to research funding and resources. Access to quality health care, early diagnosis, and specialized care for SCD is often limited for marginalized communities. This results in delayed interventions, unnecessary suffering, and a diminished quality of life for our residents. These racial disparities are unacceptable. They reflect long-standing inequities in our healthcare system that have denied people of color access to quality care. In fact, hospitals have only begun testing for sickle cell trade and SCD in 2006. I wanna share this story with you. I was born in Haiti, and they test me for sickle cell trait. And I knew I was sickle cell trait because we talk about that in school as a little kid. When I came to America, before I got married, I had to, the first question I asked my husband is, are you sickle cell trait? But in 2006, meaning that an entire generation born before this time may be unaware of their carrier status. The statistics are sobering. With one in 13 black or African American babies born with sickle cell trait, emphasizing the immediate need for early detection and education. SCD is not just a health issue. It is a grave public health concern. It is our solemn duty to act promptly and decisively. Individuals and families grappling with SCD deserve more than our sympathy. They deserve access to specialized, comprehensive, and interrupted care to achieve the best possible outcomes. Newborn, prenatal, and preconception screening, genetic counseling, and education of patients, families, schools, and healthcare providers are not just preventive measures. They are lifelines. To address these pressing issues, 
I am proud to introduce Entry 968A, which would establish sickle cell um, education and screening program with culturally sensitive and competent care along with a resolution supporting two New York State bills, which is S1890, A2661, known as Sickle Cell Treatment Act, and S1839A, A2609, which seeks to establish a sickle cell disease de detection an education program with the NYS Department of Health and create sickle cell centers of excellence and outpatient treatment centers. Together, these initiatives could be a game changing in increasing awareness about SCD and improving access to quality prevention care and treatment ultimately reduce health disparities, complications, and mortality associated with SCD. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all the witnesses who are joining us today. And we will take everyone's perspective into consideration as we continue our work on Entry 968A and pre-consider resolution. Before I conclude, I want to extend my thanks to hospital committee staff, including policy analyst Manor Butt and Rie Ogazaronra, my staff, as well as data and finance analyst Julia uh, Friedenberg, James Hu, and Alicia Miranda for their continued work on this important issue. With that, I will turn to Health Committee Chair Shulman for her remarks on today's proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Narcisse. Good morning, everyone. I am Councilmember Lynn Schulman, Chair of the New York City Council Committee on Health. Uh, I want to especially thank my uh, colleague, Chair Narcisse, for her uh, opening remarks and for sharing her life experience, because I think that's very important. And I just want to make, I want to digress for a minute and say that the majority of the members of the council have life experiences that they bring to the table, and that's why this council is very influential in what goes on in the city. So I want to thank you, Chair Narcisse, for that. I also want to thank my colleagues in the administration for joining us today for this important discussion on sickle cell disease. I want to acknowledge the members were joined by Councilmember Ariola, Councilmember Menon, Councilmember Remotely, Councilmember Moya, Councilmember Barron. Okay. Um, before I begin, oh, that's it. Sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder caused by a mutation in the protein of red blood cells, which are responsible for carrying oxygen throughout the entire body. Because it is a disease of the blood, there can be numerous complications, such as strokes, organ failures, infections, and severe pain. Pain with sickle cell disease is not only common, but also excruciating and tends to worsen as patients get older. The disease is also the most expensive to New York State Medicaid. Data from the New York State Department of Health and compiled by N NYU Langone shows that in 2021, majority of patients admitted to hospitals for sickle cell complications were on Medicaid with an average cost of $18,000 per admission. The financial burden for those suffering, as well as the burden on our healthcare system, is undeniable. The most recently available data shows that the total hospitalization costs associated with sickle cell disease were estimated at almost $500 million in 2004 and is likely up to at least $1 billion in 2023. Yet New York State has cut funding for sickle cell care by about 66 percent over the last 20 years. Those suffering from the disease deserve high quality and cost effective care. The emotional, physical, and financial burden that sickle cell puts on individuals and families is significant, from the cost of ongoing medical care to the challenges of navigating insurance co coverage and hospital visits. I look forward to hearing from members of the public on this issue, as well as from the administration, on how the city is supporting New Yorkers with sickle cell disease and how the council can help support these efforts. I want to conclude by again thanking Chair Narcisse as well as the committee staff for their work on this hearing. Committee counsels Chris Pepe and Sarah Sucha and policy analyst Manure Butt as well as Danielle Glantz who's the finance analyst. I also want to thank my team, Jonathan Boucher, 
Seth Urbinder, and Kevin McAleer. And I'll turn it back over to Chair Narcisse. Thank you, Chair. Like we just said today before, is personal. So we're gonna hear um, from um, Dr. Rivland for being here, and thank you. And I will pass it on to. So anyone do I know? No, nobody else online. So I'll pass it on to. I'll pass it on to. So Viva, Viva. Thank you. Hi. We will now hear testimony from the administration, uh, Dr. Kenneth Rivlin and Dr. Tony Aceline. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, uh, before we begin, I will administer the affirmation. Uh, panelists, please raise your right hand. I will read the affirmation once and then call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Rivlin? Yes. Dr. Aislinn? Yes. Thank you. You may begin with re when ready, Dr. Rivlin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairpersons, Nassis and Shulman, and the members of the Committees on Health and Hospitals. My name is Kenneth Rivlin, and I am the Director of the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at New York City Health and Hospitals, Jacoby. I am joined by Dr. Tony Esselin, thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer at New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding access to sickle cell care in New York City. Health and Hospitals is proud to provide high quality care to all New Yorkers, including those affected by sickle cell disease. Historically, with support from the City Council, two of the first comprehensive sickle cell centers in the nation were established at health and hospitals in the 1980s. To start, I would like to commend the committee for prioritizing sickle cell disease. As highlighted in the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's 2019 report, Addressing Sickle Cell Disease, a Strategic Plan and Blueprint for Action. Sickle cell disease is a microcosm of how issues of race, ethnicity, and identity come into conflict with, healthcare, with issues of healthcare. Despite being recognized by the federal government as a disparity disease, sickle cell disease receives limited resources and attention compared to other healthcare priorities. Health and Hospitals is committed to improving the lives of those affected by sickle cell disease. As frontline providers, we see the inequities in patients' experience, quality of care, and health outcomes for sickle cell patients, and are actively working to change this. Today, I will share information on our current services, on the current services Health and Hospitals provides in regards to sickle cell disease and the work we are doing to improve the care and outcomes from those living with sickle cell disease. We are proud to share that our system is a national leader in sickle cell disease, tackling patient and provider education, research, and quality improvement to ensure those with sickle cell disease can get the best possible care. Health and Hospitals is one of the largest providers of sickle cell care in the nation. We have six New York State designated hemoglobinopathy centers that provide services for children identified with sickle cell disease and trait by newborn screening. This is at Lincoln Hospital, Jacoby, Metropolitan, Elmhurst, and Kings County. And two comprehensive lifespan centers at Kings and Queens. In addition, our 11 hospitals provide state-of-the-art acute care and ambulatory centers across our network can ensure prenatal testing, genetic counseling, and social services. Approximately one-fourth of the 10,000 individuals living with sickle cell disease in New York State touch our system each year. Additionally, Health and Hospitals partners with community-based organizations to offer patient support groups through New York Hospital Jacoby, Queens, and Kings County. These meetings are held over Zoom and extend and extended to those with sickle cell disease across our entire system. 
Our community health workers partner with local organizations to provide community outreach, to provide education outreach to the community and sickle cell disease services. System-wide, Health and Hospitals has implemented procedural changes to better serve those with sickle cell disease. These include developing a sickle cell navigator in our electronic medical records to guide, the best, pra to guide best practices. Yearly stigma training for ED staff in partnership with community-based organizations. A sickle cell advocacy tool. Hydroxyurea training for medical staff and providers and establishing the use of individualized pain plans or pain protocols for all our emergency departments. In addition, Health and Hospitals Office of Population Health has created a quality improvement learning collaborative using Project ECHO, Extensions for Community Health Outcomes Model. Project ECHO is an internationally recognized telementoring tele innovation that leverages telecommunication technologies to move knowledge. The collaboration supports efforts to improve health outcomes and experiences with patients with sickle cell disease, focusing on the goals such as standardizing emergency room pain protocols and stigma reduction. Health and Hospitals is also a member of various prestigious national networks working to advance the treatment and care for sickle cell disease. We are a designated member of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers, an organization that recognizes systems that provide high quality comprehensive care. h, &H is also a member of the American Society of Hematology's Sickle Cell Disease Clinical Trial Network, whose goal is to accelerate progress in the development of new treatments. Out of the 20 member consortiums, we are the only public hospital system. Being a member allows us to provide patients with the opportunity to participate in clinical research and provide our patients a voice in how this research is being done. Health and Hospitals is part of the Health Resources and Service Administration's Northeast Region Sickle Cell Treatment Demonstration Project. As the New York State lead, we are working to eliminate inequities in sickle cell care through quality improvement initiatives, such as increasing the use of disease-modifying drugs, improving sick, sickle cell trait counseling, establishing pediatric to adult transition programs, and connecting unaffiliated patients to our medical home using community health workers. Other initiatives include decreasing the stigma of sickle cell disease in the emergency department through collective impact with our community sickle cell community-based organizations and utilizing individualized pain plans in emergency departments. I am also happy to share that Health and Hospitals was the only center in the country to receive a prestigious grant from Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health for the years 2020 through 2023 to increase the use of a disease-modifying drug, hydroxyurea, through a shared mental model and value-based payments. Hydroxyurea has been shown to decrease the chronic vascular damage that occurs in sickle cell disease, increase the quality of life, and decrease mortality. But less than 50% of eligible patients use this medication. The goal of this grant was to increase its use by 10%, by having all clinicians, ED, primary care, and hematologists help support patients' hydroxyurea clinical decisions. Health and Hospitals is appreciative of the attention being given to education, treatment, and outreach towards sickle cell disease in New York City. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify and your continued support for Health and Hospitals. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Doctor, for being here, and thank you for the work that um, h, h is doing. I appreciate that. Um, sickle cell patients in New York, right? We know it's a lot. 
How many patients received treatment for sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia last year? Can you disaggregate this data to reflect race, age, um, borough, neighborhood, and comorbidity? Okay. Comorbidity, sorry. Comorbidity. Sorry, that word got me, my tongue's twisted. Okay. I can tell you about what's happening at um, health and hospitals. Mm -hmm. We follow approximately 1,200 patients with sickle cell disease within our system. And by follow, I mean to see twice in a period of 18 months. Um, we, um, the majority of those patients are African Americans. Um, What's between, the number? Can you break between, it down? Yeah, between 85% and 90 in that range, I don't have the exact number, it's like 88, 86% are um, black Americans and about 15% are Hispanic Americans. Nationwide, the numbers are about 90% black Americans and about 10% Hispanic. The difference is we see a large, in our center, we see a larger Hispanic population. Um, uh, Age-wise, um, it's about 60% um, are adults and about 40% are children. Um, the numbers in our system, we follow about 700 adults and um, about 500 children. Um, I'm sorry, that's why I remember the question. Like bull and neighborhood. So the majority of patients are in Brooklyn, then followed by the Bronx. No surprising because that's where black people mostly and Hispanic yes. live, right? Yes. How many newborn babies were diagnosed with sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia, or sickle cell trait when tested last year? All infants born in New York State are tested for sickle cell disease and as a byproduct of that sickle cell trait. About, I don't know the number for last year, about 250 individuals are born with sickle cell disease in New York State in a year. Can you repeat the number again? About 250. It's about one in 1,100 um, births in New York State have sickle cell disease. How many patients overall were diagnosed with sickle cell disease? sickle cell anemia or sickle cell trade? You said you don't have the number last year? I don't have the exact number for New York State for last year. Okay. Okay, the number over the past. Um... You know, that was one of the problem for us because the last data that we had um, was 2008. The data coming, um, the data for sickle cell disease is a problem, right? We have no national system tracking this. We, as part of the Sickle Cell, National Alliance of Sickle Cells, are creating databases to be able to track sickle cell disease across the nation. So we have a database called Grandad that centers that are part of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers use. We are also part of the ASH Clinical Trial Network and we submit the identified data from our system um, to be able to understand nationally what's going on with sickle cell disease. Information about the births for New York um, State for sickle cell trait and disease can be gotten from the New York State Department of Health. And that number can be gotten per year, that number's tracked. Um, I don't, I use my word wisely. I feel like if it was a disease that is um, kind of for other race, it would have been, numbers would have been there because we see the statistic, pe folks don't even get to live up to their age, if they're lucky to age 50, right here in New York City and New York State. And, um, we're talking about a billion of dollars, budget 200, you know, and yet um, 
we have so many black folks and Hispanic living among us and yet the diseases that are affecting them, it seems like irrelevant in when it comes to, to investing in, in, in addressing inequities in our healthcare system. So me as a chair of a hospital committee, affected by it, I have the tread. So you know how I'm looking at the, so the statistic as well, and it's not pleasant. It's, everything you're saying is correct. Mm -hmm. And it's historically correct. Um, back in the 70s, the Black Panthers used to say that if sickle cell disease was a Caucasian disease, we would have a cure by now. I'm not sure I agree with the cure by now. It's a difficult thing, disease to cure. But the priority has always been low. So in the 1970s, there was a classic paper called Sickle Cell Disease High Prevalence low priority, and that has not changed. So that's why I'm so happy to be here before your committee, because you're prioritizing sickle cell disease. Historically, in the 1980s, the sickle cell, the prioritization of sickle cell disease helped the creation of two comprehensive sickle cell centers. So it's something that working together we can make a huge impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I really truly believe we came a long way because right now I'm sitting here as a chair of hospital committee in the city council and I have you willing to say what it is. So that's mean we're making progress. That's what I still believe that New York City is a great city. So we can talk about things that um, nobody gonna kill us when we get out. <laughs> so we're making progress and we're gonna make sure that we address the inequities. And I have my partner here sitting next <laughs> to me you know, to to address the inequities and um, seeing the the progress we made, that give me hope, and I hope we don't go backward, we go forward. So that's what I have to add to this. Um, sickle cell trade in New York City, and I mean, what is the current prevalence of sickle cell disease and sickle cell trade in New York City, and how it evolved over the past decade? Can you provide an overview of newborn screening? program for SCD and SCT in New York City. Are there any recent developments and improvements in the screening process? All infants born in New York State are tested for the disease and trait. Um, what we do with that information for disease is well-defined. Um, New York State has developed a very comprehensive system to identify and get into care all children identified with disease. What we do as TRAIT has not been standardized. And one of the quality improvement initiatives that we are just beginning to implement, just beginning to test, is how we provide TRAIT information. So we're working to ensure that all patients get standardized education about sickle cell trait within the health and hospital system. We're also, um, New York State has just created a system whereby if you were born in New York State and you're a um, teenager, you can reach out to your doctor or to New York State directly and get your trait identity, okay? So we're trying to, through quality improvement, trying to establish that as part of our program. We're only testing it in one of our institutions, and we're going to try to learn how it works and what the problems are and how to do it. Does that answer your question? Close, because um, we still have a lot of investment to do, and I'm counting on you to push for New York State in general to address this. Um, how does um, DOHMH and HNH support individuals living with SCD in terms of managing their condition, assessing medication, and addressing complications? Can you provide details on specialized treatment centers and or clinics within the HNH and DOHMH network for SCD patients? 
I'll, I'll start with um, health and hospital systems. We have six state-of-the-art, state-designated hemoglobin. Six? Six New York State-designated mm -hmm. hemoglobinopathy centers that provide comprehensive care to children identified with newborns and ident that have sickle cell disease. We have two lifespan sickle cell centers across our system that provide comprehensive care to adults. All 11 of our hospitals can provide acute care for um, people with sickle cell disease and all our ambulatory centers can provide um, genetic counseling, um, uh, testing, et cetera, for um, people that want the information. And um, patients with sickle cell disease get good primary care within our ambulatory centers. <clears throat> Thank you. What are the current pain management options that are offered um, to sickle cell patients who present with acute or chronic pain? What factors are used to determine whether a patient will be prescribed pain management medication? Can you actually give me some data to this to reflect race, age, and borough neighborhood? And I can follow up question two at once. How opioid medications prescribed or used in hospital setting are non-opioid options offered to patients? What are the current guidelines that inform the use or prescription of opioid-based medication? Are they got um, rails in place to prevent the exacerbation of the opioid crisis? Um, complicated question. I can break it down into a couple pieces that I can answer. And um, if you have further questions, I'll get back to you. Um, we have established the use of individualized pain plans in our center. Um, can I say that all our patients have that individualized pain plan right this second? No, this is what we're working to do. This is our quality improvement initiative. And um, the individualized pain plan that we designed here is consistent with the national objectives for pain management. I can also say that as part of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers, health and hospitals um, created something that's going to be used nationally, and that is the patient's preferred profile. So how does a patient, in the pain plan, there's a comment to reduce the stigma of sickle cell disease of how the patient wants the doctor, what the patient wants the doctor to know about them. So that originated health and hospitals and is now going to be part of the future national pain plan that's coming out in 2024. That's one part. So ideally, we'd like to have every patient with an individualized pain plan. If they do not have an individualized pain plan, there should be a good quality protocol used in our EDs. And we just, through our quality improvement efforts, established that all 11 of our hospitals are using a national state-of-the-art pain protocol in the EDs, using op opioids and other um, disease um, pain-relieving drugs in the system. So we have that. Um, with regards to um, other types of pain management, it varies by the skills of the doctors providing the care. Um, when I ask for the data, like in race and age and stuff, because um, it's very important, because I used to be an ER nurse, mm -hmm. and I did not have all the training we talked. So we came a long way. So thank you if it's, that is what's going on right now. Because um, one of the thing in the ER, I used to do triage, and you have to really actually take it out of the person that come with 
unbearable pain to tell you that it's sickle cell. Sometimes it takes a long conversation to get to the sickle cell. And many of them seen by others that the drug addict. And in the meanwhile, it's a disease the person dealing with. So I'm Caucasian. I can imagine nothing worse than being an African-American male coming to the ED in a pain crisis. We are working to that. Are we perfect at that? No, but we're working to educate our providers with partnership with the community-based organizations that are behind me to train physicians about the stigma of sickle cell disease and to train them that um, it's a horrible disease and the patients are coming. And if you make a mistake with regards to over-medicating, it's not your role. It's your role to believe the patient. So. so the education is very important Absolutely. for all party involved of treating patient of access to anyone with um, sickle cell or sickle cell treat. Going from the moment they hit the ED, from the unit assistant to the triage nurse to um, the pr providers, hospital staff, um, environmental health, all need that type of education not to perceive sickle cell patients as drug seeking. I wish it was perfect, but the education that um, the education as being standardized part of our EDs is just beginning and uh, should be improved. It also is being used as the model. So if we're successful within our system, it will be used as the model for the um, sickle cell treatment demonstration project in the Northeast. Yeah. What are the most common complications that I observe in sickle cell patients in New York City? Sickle cell patients are susceptible to episode of pain, frequent infections, acute chest syndrome, pulmonary hypertension, organ damage, and other various type of painful complication. Do hospital records distinguish between sickle cell patients and non-sickle cell patients when individuals report experiencing the symptoms? Um, yes, we, we do our best to separate out. The, there are different types of sickle cell disease, so we're collecting that type of data on the patient, and we're trying to um, decrease these complications, they're, they're saying. So hydroxyurea decreases the complications, decreases acute chest. Okay. We're trying to ensure that all our patients get transcranial Dopplers that decrease stroke. Hydroxyurea use also decreases stroke. So we're trying to um, make the changes necessary and ensure that this is the standard of care we're providing. You know, I was waiting for hydroxyurea to, say, to talk about it if the patient, in especially King County in the underserved community, have access to that, because that can help. The answer is it's the, you mentioned the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute. It's a recommendation that all patients with hemoglobin SS or S beta thal zero um, receive this medication as part of this um, Office of Minority Health Grant. We have created educational tools and are ensuring that uh, our hospitals for pediatrics, that all our physicians in the ED, in primary care pediatrics, and hematologists, of course, know and utilize this medication and that the hematologists monitor the complications. That's it. That's it. That's it. Um, before I, for, I continue with the question, I want to recognize um, the council member Brooks Powers. That's with us. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, online. Okay. Um, so blood transfusion is one of the most critical treatment for patients with SCD. How is the ongoing blood shortage has impacted care for the people with um, SCD? We have been lucky that um, we prioritize sickle cell disease and our patients on chronic transfusions 
for sickle cell disease. I have not noticed any problem. We have the New York Blood, Blood Center behind me. We also have worked to um, do blood drives within our hospital system um, for sickle cell, highlighting sickle cell disease and the New York Blood Center, which is somewhere behind me, can attest to that. Uh, I'm going to go backward a little bit. Can, can you list the centers again? So the pediatric state designated sickle cell centers, um, let me pull my paper so I don't misspeak, um, Lincoln and Jacoby, which are in the Bronx, Harlem and Metropolitan in Manhattan, Elmhurst in Queens, and Kings in Brooklyn. Those are the pediatric centers. And the um, true comprehensive adult centers or lifespan centers are at Kings County and at Queens. Kings County has been since the 1980s and Queens since the, uh, became a true comprehensive center around uh, 2016, 2017. Thank you. Are there out of pocket costs of hydrocelia at H and H facilities? No, the cost for hydroxyurea um, should be provided by the insurance companies, etc. So Medicaid should provide it without any problems. I haven't noticed any specific out of pocket costs. <sighs> Healthcare access and disparities. What are the specific challenges faced by individuals and families affected by SCD in terms of accessing healthcare, specialized treatment, and support services within h, &H network? How is DOHMH collaborating with the healthcare providers and community organization to reduce racial disparities in SCD diagnosis and care? Okay. Um, can you just quickly, the title of the question? I, oh, <laughs> what are the specific challenges faced okay. by individuals yes. and families affected by SCD in terms of accessing healthcare, specialized treatment, and support services within the h, &H network? Okay, at h, &H um, we do a wonderful job for pediatrics, and we are working very hard on a national problem with sickle cell disease, and that is the tr um, transition and transfer to adult care. Um, so for pediatrics, I think we do an excellent job. I think we do a pretty good job. We've built into our system transition education. The problem both within New York City, within the Health and Hospital Corporation, and nationally, is providers providing um, care to sickle cell patients. Patients will get care at comprehensive centers, that is state of the art. They will get good care with any hematologist provider in the clinics that go on, but those centers that aren't comprehensive have limited resources, and that is the limited number of social workers, nurse practitioners, the support staff. And that is just, a, to me, a financial issue across the country. This is a national problem. I'm sorry. Things are complex when it comes to underserved communities, and yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to add to what my colleague was saying in terms of, you know, what DOH is doing. Um, specifically, we share your passion for uh, eliminating inequities that are occurring across the city when it comes to medical care in general. We're talking about, you know, educating clerical clinicians, the history of discrimination within the medical field, um, and applying our equity lens to clinical practices and the importance of cultural sensitivity. And so all of those things are at the forefront of what the, the health department is doing specifically for healthcare um, in the city. And so in supporting our, we're in support of everything our h, &H colleagues are doing. 
Um, I'm going to jump to um, DOHMH. For, before I do so, I want to recognize Chair Joseph joining us on Zoom. All right. Um, did that collection reporting that we have, when was the last time sickle cells related data was collected in New York City? According to our finding, the most recent data was published in 2008. That is more than 15 years ago. Why has there been no reporting on sickle cell disease in recent years? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, just like we were talking about before, and I wanted to get this opportunity to explain the data a little bit better. Um, collecting sickle cell data is really complex because the data is not regularly collected by the state or federal governments. Additionally, various aspects of the data, including data on the number of patients treated, the disaggregation that you were asking about earlier, the diagnosis, they are held by different insurance and hospital entities with limitation on what data can be accessed to ensure that the, there's patient privacy. As a result, the data available to us is limited. That said, our agency utilizes the most recent New York State Sparks sickle cell data, as well as CDC's sickle cell data to inform our understanding of this issue. So let me explain Sparks real quick. It's the statewide planning and research cooperative system, Sparks, also known as Sparks. It is an all-payer data reporting system operated by the New York State Department of Health. Sparks collects patient level data on patient characteristics, diagnoses and treatment, and it's an important source of data for conditions just like sickle cell since it allows us insight into hospital utilization of patients with sickle cell. However, it does not include um, information on sickle cell incidents, prevalence, or treatment outside of the hospital setting. And there is a lag, there's a data lag between one to three years. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Chair of Hospital, I mean Chair of Health, because um, we need more information, so I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Chair Schulman. Thank you, I'm actually gonna ask um, uh, my colleague, Sylvina Brooks-Powers has another appointment, so I'm gonna um, give over the, the questioning to her and then I'll, I'll take it back. Thank you, Chairs. I um, just have three brief questions. Um, first, if I'm an adult looking for comprehensive care for sickle cell anemia, how many facilities are there outside of Manhattan that can provide that care? Next, what size of hospital or medical facility is required to support comprehensive care for sickle cell anemia? And can you talk about the cure for sickle cell for the sickle cell disease? What makes it so risky? And is there progress being made toward making this cure more widely available? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't jot your questions down. Uh, can you repeat your first question? Absolutely. If I'm an adult looking for okay. comp comprehensive care, okay. So for um, comprehensive care, you can work with community-based organizations to find out what's going on. So um, outside of Manhattan, we have um, Kings County, long historical center, provides comprehensive care. Um, uh, Queens Hospital. Um, there's um, other medical centers that would be part of the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers. Um, in the Bronx, you have Montefiore Medical System has a comprehensive center. Um, in Manhattan, you have Columbia and Mount Sinai. Um, in Brooklyn, it's King's is the best. So there are ways to do it, but I would ask my community-based um, organizations, I would, my, my, I would ask the community-based organizations where they would recommend you go. So that was the first question, did I answer it? Um, I'm piecing, counting how many you said, but you know, it'd be interesting to know in terms of beyond Queens Hospital, are there any more in Queens besides that? 
Um, I do not know the answer of that. I deal with the health and hospital system, and I deal nationally with the National Alliance of Sickle Cell Centers, and I do not um, remember another center. I could be wrong. Your second? This is unusual. Usually we have this panel answer the question. Now, since you have an answer for thing, I guess I'm going to allow you one second to say it loud and clear so she can hear you. Okay. Okay. okay, so thank you, because she wanted to hear you. Usually we don't do it that way. You got the answer, right? Okay. Yeah. No, now we, can't, we have to go back until it's your time. <laughs> All right, no more from you. We're going to continue this way. Okay. Thank you. Your, your second question, I'm sorry. No problem. What size of a hospital or medical facility is required to support comprehensive care for a sickle cell? Anemia. I, just speaking in general, I don't think there's a size that defines it. It really is the support staff. There is a National Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease guidelines on what makes up a center of excellence. And um, there are some, outs I'm here to testify about health and hospitals. Um, there, are, um, there are rural centers with just a few patients that provide excellent care. Um, you just need the support staff to do it. Do, do the Gotham centers often have support for that? Because I know in Rockaway, for example, we have a Gotham center that's going to be opening up that is health and hospital. So would that be a facility that offers sickle cell anemia services? I believe they can. I believe they can provide good primary care for the patients, and they can refer the patients to sickle cell experts within our system. Thank you. And I'm sorry. Your last question was about uh, curative therapies, and um, I just think it's important to touch on that. And the. Potential for curative therapies is real and will happen in most of our patients' lifetime. Um, the problem with curative therapies is um, your need to do a bone marrow transplant or gene therapy, and that, inter that um, requires us to suppress the person's system. We need to get rid of the bone marrow that they have and replace it or with either a donor's bone marrow or a gene modifying, and that immune suppressive therapy is life threatening. Thank you, and thank you, chairs. Thank you. All right, um, so my, I'm sorry. I want to recognize that we have Council Member Feliz has joined us. Uh, so I want to ask does DOHMH have any working? mechanism to collect data on SCD and SCT? Thank you, Council Member, for your question. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, the collecting system for this disease is complicated and it's complex, and we have to depend on SPARCS data in order to see exactly what's going on with, that, with the state of that disease. We don't specifically collect it. We use what the state has available, and then there's a one to three year lag. In is, there any, is there anything that can be done to make that an easier process? I would have to get back to my colleagues. It's something that we think is of high priority in understanding how we can get this data and leverage this data to help our community. Because if we need to ask our colleagues in the state legislature or if there's anything we can do, we'd like to be able to do that. So if you could oh, do that for us. I will definitely take that back. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Since 2006, all U.S. hospitals are required to perform newborn screening to identify health risk factors in infants. Newborn screening typically includes testing for a core set of conditions, which may include metabolic disorders, genetic diseases, endocrine disorders, and hemoglobin globinopathies, such as sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Since SCD and C SCT related data is already being collected at birth by New York State, how do DOHMH and HNH utilize that data to make decisions for SCD care at your facilities? All infants identified with sickle cell disease are connected with a state designated hemoglobinopathy center. Um, so disease, it's um, a required entry in, into care. We, um, um, our, go our goal is to see those patients identified within two months and start them on um, penicillin prophylaxis and begin the education of the families within that time period. So for sickle cell disease, we have a good system of care. Yeah, for the DOHMH, we don't provide those clinical services, but we use that data to inform the work that we're doing across um, health, health inequities in New York City and figuring out ways to decrease those inequities uh, across the city. And what initiatives are in place to increase public awareness about SCD and SCT? Yeah, thank you for the question. We're, we're, we're trying to, uh, we are currently in a exploratory phase in having conversations with our CBOs and FBO partners and trying to uplift their concerns in the way that we are actually going to address these issues in the city. If we can, if you can share with us what you put together to do that, I know that um, we want to, that's something that's really important. And in line with that, um, you know, maternal health is obviously an issue, and do we, do we talk to um, pregnant people about SCD and SCT and when they, come, when they come in for prenatal care? Right, you wanna take that? Yeah. Um, the American College of Obstetrics recommends that all, all patients, uh, all pregnant women get tested for um, hemoglobinopathies. Okay. And that's just part of routine standard care now. Okay. Um, how much does DOHMH spend on SCD each year, do you know? I do not have that information. If you can get that for us? I, I can ask. Yeah, that would be great. Um, what are some, in line with that, what are some of your funding streams for SCD? And how do you distribute it between treatment, educational efforts, and research? So if you have to get back, I mean, you can just do that. Um, give me one. Uh, I, I want to recognize Councilmember Gutierrez has joined us. Um, I'm going to ask you about the legislation that we have that we're talking about today. So there's a, a resolution and an intro. So Resolution 711. What are your thoughts on our resolution in support of Senate Bill 1839A and Assembly 2609 and S1890A2661, the Sickle Cell Treatment Act? As you may know, uh, S1839A, A2609, sorry, aims to establish a sickle cell disease detection and education program within the New York State Department of Health to provide information and resources to individuals at SCD their families, health care providers, and the general public, whereas the Sickle Cell Treatment Act, if passed, would establish five sickle cell centers of excellence and ten outpatient treatment centers staffed by specialists dedicated to serving SCD patients. If passed, how would these two state bills impact SCD care in New York City? I defer to the State Department of Health. <laughs> let me, let me sorry. We, um, I'm sorry, city. No. Uh, <laughs> We, we so tremendously support okay, um, the prioritization of sickle cell disease. As New York City, as representing New York City Health and Hospitals, I can't comment on specific legislation, so I will defer to New York State, uh, New York City. 
And do you, ex do you expect the Center of Excellence to be under the purview of H&H, &H, I presume so? We would love to have the Center of Excellence, <laughs> but... Um, the, <laughs> Right. I'm going to hand over um, some more questioning to my colleague, Chair Narcisse. Thank you. Thank you. And before I get into it, I have um, Councilman Member Barron. She, he cannot speak because we don't have the quorum, but I want to see, I mean, see what he wants to say. Um, he would like this body to acknowledge that we should not discuss sickle cell without discussing the work of the Black Panther Party to raise awareness and fight for individuals living with SCD. And I think you did, Dr. Revin. So um, we appreciate his work as well for bringing it to the forefront, and I appreciate the fact that you yourself mentioned it. So. Um, Entry 968A, a local law that would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to a professional education program and public outreach campaign regarding sickle cell disease. What are your thoughts on this bill, um, its implementation and impact? Can you outline any anticipated challenges or barriers in implementing the education program and outreach campaign, and what strategies are in place to overcome them? So the health department supports efforts to raise awareness and promote more equitable access to treatment for patients with hemoglobinopathies, including sickle cell. And while the disease disproportionately affects black New Yorkers and other people of color, black New Yorkers also disproportionately face these barriers to accessing that appropriate care. Professional and medical education is also important when addressing healthcare access barriers for people living with sickle cell disease. And as a clinician, I believe we need a well-rounded approach, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, to ensure that patients have the information that they need to advocate for themselves. That also includes ensuring that clinicians are trained to the best of their abilities for, to address the best care for patients um, affected by these hemoglobinopathies. So if passed, how do you plan to implement this program? Do we have any similar programs that we can use as a model? As I said before, we are in the exploratory phase uh, working with our colleagues to make sure that we're uplifting the community as we're making our programs. It is sad, right, to talk about this right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, we talk about it in Haiti, when Haiti was Haiti. Unfortunately, it's not right now. But <laughs> that's another thing. What is, <laughs> what is the expected timeline for rolling out for the education program and launching the public outreach campaign, and what milestone and benchmarks will be monitored to track progress? Yeah, like I mentioned, we're in the exploratory phase, but I will get back to you. Hmm. I think I had some other question before I part, pass it on to the child. Oh, somebody have questions? Perfect. So before I continue with my question, I think um, our colleague Judas can have a question or some question. Thank you, chairs, um, and thank you both for hosting this um, this joint hearing today on this really important topic. I want to be very honest. The first time I ever heard about someone having sickle cell disease was left eye from TLC, um, and it was something that growing up I learned obviously acutely impacted black people and people of color, and so I think this is such an important hearing and certainly support both pieces of legislation. Um, and I'm sorry I'm late, so maybe you addressed this and I missed it, but my understanding is that there's very limited funding to support. Is it testing specifically for sickle cell disease in communities, or what? Is, is there a, a time when it can be detected in people and it's not being detected? What is the process to, under, like, to evaluate whether someone, um, I guess, in, upon reading the report, I understand they can carry the trait versus the disease. I'm speaking about the disease. At, at what point are, are we made aware that someone has a disease? If you're born in New York State, you're um, automatically tested for the disease. If you present to physicians with anemia, it will be part of the workup for 
so if you're born outside of New York State, you um, and you present with anemia, it's part of the workup for anemia. Unders and how soon in New York State is that? Uh, how how early in someone's life are are they tested for this? They're tested um, at birth, so um, either the day of birth or a day later, mm -hmm. and the results come back within a week. And in these instances, are pregnant people known to carry the trait? Is there a different kind of testing um, that happens, or it's only testing that you can do once the child is born? No, testing can be done at um, any time in a person's life. It's a genetic disease, so we can easily test by doing a simple hemoglobin electrophoresis and determine whether you have the trait or not. Right, but they, you're not, there's no, the testing happens once they're born. You cannot test, like I know there's certain blood work while a person is pregnant that you can test we, for to we, rule out. We do test pregnant women mm -hmm. to see if they have the trait to offer them reproductive counseling about it. New York State is trying to set up a process and we are trying to do it as a quality improvement initiative here so that if you want this information and you were born in New York State, that trait information can be given to you. If you are of reproductive age and you want to be tested, any primary care provider can provide that testing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then my next question is, in adults who are out of New York State, growing up in New York State, come here um, and test for anemia, you mentioned then at that time they can be tested for, only if they present with anemia. You would only, as a provider, you would only test someone for if you think they have the disease. Right. So if their clinical history is consistent with the disease you would do the appropriate testing for it as a hematologist or a primary care doctor. And is there a time that is, so and I, and I understand that, um, totally respect what you're saying. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, are there instances where adults, adults age um, may not be aware that they have anemia because I know it's an excruciating, it's a painful disease to live with. And you know, the, I guess the, 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 the notion that's out there about uh, women that are, are oftentimes not believed by doctors that are in pain, black people that are often in pain and not believed by doctors. So I'm just trying to get to like the technical. So m m adults with anemia, whether they're in New York State or not, know they have it or are there instances where it's not uh, life-threatening that they could just move about and, and not know they have it? There are people living with sickle cell disease that do not know they have it. Uh, I can tell you a personal incident of one of the um, parents of a patient who was diagnosed with sickle cell disease, and he was a physician. He had sickle cell disease. He had a mild variant of sickle cell disease. He was a physician and never knew he had it. So after we tested the child, we um, offered testing to the family. Okay, thank you. I'll, I know my time is up, but I'll, I'll stick around. Thank you so much, Chairs. Thank you. No, if you have you have extra questions. Okay. Yeah, I guess I guess I know, and this is what we're here for today, yeah. right? Is to like make sure that we ultimately pass legislation that is um, responsive to this need in those instances where people are living with it. I guess what are some of the things that we can be doing? What are the support that physicians and our institutions need to really raise awareness about why why at this point? isn't it not just safe to ensure that everyone gets tested for this early? Like, it's just a, in the way that we test for all type of illnesses when someone is young, is that not a, a step towards uh, better data, better management potentially? I understand your question. And um, it's, if you have symptoms, you should be tested. If you have, are asymptomatic, then it's a personal choice on what you want to do. So having But if you're asymptomatic, you don't even know, right? You don't, you don't know to like, l let me talk to my physician to test, to, to specifically test for this. I, um, I, if you're anemic, <laughs> you, you get, you're known to have anemia. A person does a CBC, they see your hemoglobin's low, they look to see, 
if young red blood cells are high, they're going to make the diagnosis. Those are not the, those are, um, would be a rare, there would be rare instances. Okay. And it becomes a personal decision between you and your physician, how you work things out. Okay. And so my last question, sorry, Chair. Um, but the number, like the numbers that we have, are the numbers not staggering enough for us to feel that testing for, or is is the testing very expensive? Like I, what I'm trying to say is like there there are a small population, but still instances where people might not know they're anemic, right? And that's really like the impetus for testing for this disease. Um, but is it is it more more cost effective that we're not just testing everybody across the board, or is it because we just don't? There's just not an, a, a high enough need, I guess, is what I'm trying to understand. For me, not being an expert, not being in this field, it feels like the safest thing to do is, with the information that we have, is to test everyone, you know? But, but if that is not cost-effective or not realistic, I guess that's what I'm trying to get. Because what you're saying is someone has to be under some kind of, uh, you know, have health insurance to be testing frequently, right? Know that they're anemic um, and then potentially have symptoms to even think to ask, what do I have? Because if they're asymptomatic, then th this is not, uh, this is not like a, a line of questioning that they're asking. Yeah, I wanted to jump in. Thank you. From a primary care perspective, I'm an internist and a pediatrician, so I get to see both of these and, and I'm not a specialist, so this is you're really raising something important in terms of what we're doing for primary care and how we're accessing primary care. And that's another one of the places where DOHMH is, is working on. Because people, like you're saying, people shouldn't be walking around not knowing their status. Right. Um, and the only way they're going to know if they're asymptomatic is if we can get our hands on them, right? If we can get them in front of a primary right. care doctor so that we can do an assessment mm -hmm. and actually say, hey, something's not right. You might not feel okay, but something's not right. Let's, let's check these things. And so part of the reason why folks are not potentially walking around without having knowledge is that we can't get our hands on them in the primary care uh, space. Mm. And that there are inequities with that, right, in terms of who's going to get access to primary care space. And so we have to, like, get to the root of the problem, right? Sickle cell is a symptom of all of the things that we're talking about here, um, which is the fact that, you know, black folks in New York City are disproportionately affected and have disproportionate access right. to care. And that's where we have to mm -hmm. focus on it because then they won't walk around with anemia that they don't know. That's right. That's right. And so I guess my, and thank you, thank you both. This is not an attack. I'm no, genuinely no, no, no. asking. No, no, we love, we love the passion. I, I guess it's passion. in your, in like, in your expertise, is it not just better to test Every, every, every young person, every kid, every, like, is that not realistic enough? So if you have sick, and you can jump in on this part, but I'm gonna say from the primary care perspective, if you have, first of all, uh, you should be looking for the newborn screen, right? The newborn screen is gonna tell you if they, it's gonna tell you if they have uh, right. sickle cell or not, right? So this is the point Great. Um, that h, h is making that we're like, hey, you know, uh, everybody who's born in New York State, um, everybody who's born in New York City, you're gonna get a newborn screen and, and we should know. If, if, if for some reason that didn't, happen, that didn't happen for you and you get into a primary care um, uh, office, for example, part of it, we just, we naturally screen everybody for everything. Are your kidneys okay? Are you, is, your, are, is your liver working? And are you anemic? These are, these are routine testing that we, that we normally do. If you're not anemic, there's no reason to go down that road. If you are anemic, even slightly anemic, then, you, then there's a process to actually investigate what's the cause of that anemia. And so um, there is blanket testing for newborns, so that's correct. When it comes to identifying folks who may be asymptomatic, mm -hmm. The asymptomatic is going to come with an indication of anemia. anemia. And at that, that point, there's a workup that needs to be done from there. Okay. And, thank you. And I thank you. That's where I was about to touch because you are anemic. And um, even, you, even you sickle cell trait, you still are anemic. There should be sign for it. But the thing that we're doing right now is having the discussion and educating mm -hmm. folks because if you born before you start testing, which is 2006, which is killing me by knowing that. But those generation prior 
will be tested. And the thing about it, one of the things that I observe myself knowing, dealing with sickle cell trait, it's just um, sometimes the test is done, but the conversation is not being passed to the families, to the father, is later on they find out the child have sickle cell trait. And I'm gonna tell you, if, you, if I did not ask, I would not know for each of my child because I was interested to know because knowing that I have sickle cell trait. Those are the things that we need to have the conversation and engage in school and everywhere, especially when we're talking about the underserved community. Um, we're not focusing on preventive care in those areas, in the black communities and brown communities. Um, my district don't even have a healthcare center. We don't have any hospital. So the teaching have to be done throughout out for people to be knowledgeable and take the step that they need to take for themselves and their family. And I do believe in preventive care. And it's not just like it is something, it is cost effective. We're spending $1.6 million for female and at least average 1.7 million in a male. So now if you do preventive care, people knows early, first of all, they would not engage in having children more likely because when you're looking at the chart, it's specific. It tells you what's gonna happen to you. So I have a chart here, which I encourage everybody that listening and following, if you don't have that chart, pull out the chart to see that is a real that's statistic, numbers, you know, tell you, like when you have a father with the trait and you have a mother normal, which I call, I don't, I don't want to say the word normal, they still use normal, I will say the one without the sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease when I say normal. So their children, um, two will be born with the trait and no, two will be born without, the, without anything. But when you have the father with the sickle cell, anemia and you have the mother without anything, which is we call normal, so all the children will be born if they have four kids. I'm based on four, sorry. I'm basing the statistic on four. So the four will be born with the sickle cell trait. And if you have the father with the sickle cell disease and the mother with the sickle cell disease, all the children, if you have four, will end up with a sickle cell disease. So those are the things that people need to know. That chart should be posted and for folks to open their eyes, even the ER, they should have a literature where people knows what's going on. If you're pregnant, especially when you have uh, uh, folks getting pregnant, they need to know their risk. They need to know what they're dealing with. And even before they get married, even in the place where they get the, 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 the license, should have those information for people to think. Because um, it's really a disease that really no one want to have a child that have, because I'm telling you my nieces, two of my nieces um, have sickle cell disease. So coming back, I had some question that I highlight that I wanna ask. Um, we need a follow up. Oh, the chart? Oh, sure. <laughs> no, you can have it, we can, you can have it. Um, so coming back to culturally sensitive care. What kind of cultural sensitivity training um, do NYC, h and nurses, doctors, and other healthcare providers currently receive? If so, what content is covered and how are healthcare practitioners held, held accountable for failing to provide culturally sensitive care for their patients? Are they, their I mean, are there channels for patient to report inappropriate or discriminating, I mean, discriminating um, behavior, discriminatory behavior. Are you working with any community-based organizations or other non-profit um, to spread awareness and increase access to SCD care? I'll say with that before I continue because I don't want to create too much confusion. With regards to culturally sensitive training that's part of um, all staff education within health and hospitals with regards to um, what happens when a patient doesn't get that. We're trying to train patients. One of the new tools we just developed is advocacy training about sickle cell disease, We're trying to train patients how to advocate for themselves about it. Um, 
Those are the two I remember. I didn't remember the last question. I'm expecting, especially folks that are serving in um, high minority area, populated um, black folks and Sp Hispanic to be well trained around that. Um, funding, how much does h and spend on SCD each year? What are some of your funding um, streams for SCD and how do you distributing it between treatment and research? You want me to repeat it? No, I, um, I, I don't have those answers. We'll have to get back to you about that. Um, with regards to research, that's a um, separate topic. And we participate with clinical trials because it's important for patients to have the opportunity to participate in research. So we're part of pharmaceutical drug trials. We are part of the national, um, we're part of the American Society of uh, Hematology Sickle Cell Clinical Trial Network. So we want our patients to have the opportunity to participate in research. So um, that's a separate topic and that funding doesn't come from patient care. So um, h and &E don't have a direct like numbers you can tell me that you're spending on that? I can't. I'm a, I'm a primary care. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a hematologist. I'm a country doctor in many regards. I don't know that financial information. So I'm guessing that we're going to get it if we're we fi it. follow up That's, email? Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to say thank you for your time because since we have another hearing coming, uh, we'll keep you all day. As you know, it's personal. Like they said in Jamaica, I think you have a skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for your time and we're looking forward to address the inequities in New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. Uh, we will be limiting public testimony today to two minutes each. For in-person panelists, please come up to the table once your name has been called. For virtual panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will, let the ti will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. For our first panel, we would like to call Thomas Moulton, Milton Wade, Yadira Navarro, Michael Landau, and Dr. Kusum Viswanathan if uh, they are available on Zoom at this moment. Um, we will be calling the five of you for this first panel. Thank you. Sorry, I would also like to note that written testimony can be submitted for up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing. Thank you. Um, can Mr. Thomas Moulton please go first? And can you uh, please recap what you said earlier about um, the centers in, that are available in Queens? Yeah, so um, I'm Dr. Thomas Moulton. I've been uh, treating, I have treated sickle cell patients for over 30 years um, in the Bronx. Um, I've primarily, I've left practice primarily because hospital administrators have destroyed at least three programs that I put together for sickle cell disease and it became very frustrating for me to be able to continue to try and give quality care when administrators would not support programs. I want to try and address some of the things that have been brought up. Yes, there is testing for sickle cell disease in pregnancy, but the interpretation of those results is completely lacking. Um, I had one patient come in who was told, her, the mother was told she had, did not have sickle cell trait, and so therefore she could not have a sickle cell disease patient. I, her son came in diagnosed with sickle cell disease because she had, S, she had beta zero thalassemia. 
And so doctors do not understand that sickle cell disease is not one genetic type of disease, but there are four main different types. And because they don't understand that, then that mother was given false information during her pregnancy. Um, we do have a medical model for sickle cell disease. That's the Sickle Cell Day Hospital. That's been known since 2000 that's been published. And that was published right here in the Bronx from Montefiore um, Adult Co Hospital. So I would encourage that all of the city hospitals have a day hospital instituted in them. Access to care is, is limited. Um, patients with sickle cell disease have silent stroke, not just overt stroke. So 13% of patients will have had a silent stroke by age one, and 27% um, will have had a silent stroke by age six. So these affect how patients are able to um, perform in school and as they get older to be able to help hold a job and be able to actually figure out how to come in to, um, to, to keep their appointments and that sort of thing. So sickle cell disease patients are thought of, adult sickle cell disease patients are thought of as being bad patients because they miss their, their appointments. And part of that is because they can't remember. And if, you know, an adult person then sends them out, you know, from their, their you know, just discharges them from their clinic because they're, quote, bad patients, but they don't realize that they have a reason. You know, if you were a Down syndrome patient, you wouldn't expect them to be able to perform adult duties like anybody else, but they expect that from sickle cell disease patients. Um, we've had a sickle cell bill in, New in the New York State Senate since 2011, and we've been lobbying since 2011, and even though we can prove that um, the care that would be coming from that bill would save them more money than the expense of the bill. There has yet been no movement in terms of the bill, and I have very little hope in terms of that the New York State Legislature will move any for forward on any of the bills that are now before them. Um, we've had newborn screening in New York State since 1975. 2006 is when all 50 states have had newborn screening. Um, the problem with newborn screening is, you know, is that, as, as Dr. Rivlin said, is, is that the disease get into care, but the trait do not necessarily get educated. If they do get educated, they get educated when they're babies and not educated when they're teenagers and they could get out and get pregnant. So many of the mothers forget to tell their children, oh, you have sickle cell trait, and then all of a sudden now they have a child with sickle cell disease because they're not continuing in terms of their education with that. Um, the other thing is, is that again, when we're doing, you know, immigrants are not necessarily tested. They come into primary care, their primary care doesn't necessarily test them. If they do, they may test them wrong. There are two different types of testing for sickle cell disease. Sickle dex, which only tell, tells you whether or not you have trait, sickle S trait. It does not tell you whether or not you have any other trait that would give you a, a, ch a chance for sickle cell disease. I've had one mother who knew that she was sickle cell trait, had her wanted her father being tested. Can you try to wrap it up because we have to leave the room? Okay, um, so he, the military tested him wrong. He had C trait, so na they now have two children with sickle cell disease because the father was given the wrong test. Um, research can be difficult because patients don't enroll in programs. Many of the sickle cell disease research studies have been closed for lack of enrollment. So this is also an, you know, an issue in terms of the sickle cell population does not trust the medical environment. I have many more things. I'd be very happy to talk to you afterwards, but there are many more other issues in terms of sickle cell disease, um, in particular in New York State, which happens to be the second most populous state for sickle cell disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, could we please have Milton Wade speak, please? My name is Milton Wade. I'm a retired New York City school teacher, and I'm also a sickle cell uh, trait carrier. Um, I have a personal story to tell, not only my own um, um, various illnesses that um, I've endured throughout my life, um, currently with uh, anemia and um, stage two kidney disease, um, but most importantly, I'm an advocate because um, on the 25th of September, we marked two years since my son lost his life to um, uh, renal medullary carcinoma, which is a uh, 
a disease, um, a, a aggressive uh, kidney cancer caused by his sickle cell trait status. Um, when he was born, they were, I was told that um, um, I had nothing to worry about. He only has a trait. And um, I'm here um, advocating for, uh, for not only for sick cell trait, but for sick cell disease because it's personal for me. Um, I've had students with sick cell disease as a teacher, but I also have been um, a sports coach, and I see a need for the education within the school system. Um, currently, um, the Public School Athletic League um, ironically, they do have on the medical form questionnaires for sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. And also, um, and on the website, it's hard to find, but it's there for exertional sickling, which comes from someone having sickle cell trait. And exertional sickling means that's when the red blood cells sickle, and um, that person can go into um, uh, emergency um, um, well, almost uh, close to being, if they not, do not receive aid, they, um, they would die on the field. The sad part is, as a coach, I had to ask myself, why am I not trained? And I've been coaching as, as a, a New York City public school, um, high school coach for 27 years. And we're not taught anything. So even if, if, a, if a child was in, um, it was having an exertional sickling episode, um, or the fact that someone in my, on my team um, puts down that they have sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait, I wouldn't know how to respond. And there are 46,000 kids per year in the New York City Public um, Athletic League who participate in sports, and there's a void that needs to be filled. Not only that, um, when it comes back to the hospital, when we talk, when the question was asked, by that doctor about the, the statistics, um, I do know that the, um, that minority um, organization, which is part of NIH, gave the funding. The, um, the time span, actually, the, the, um, the, they do not have to report till September 29th. So you're asking for data that they, don't, that they really do not have yet. And that's in defense of them. Now, in regards to what needs to be done, I'm here advocating, this is my, uh, I've been on this journey for three years, um, contacting my, my um, state representative, uh, congressional representative, and um, you know, it gets sent to SEC to file 13, which no one hears about. So I'm, I'm well aware of, of sickle cell disease and the trait, and um, um, Ms. Narcisa, I'm working with one of your um, assistants, and, and afterwards uh, there's some amendments and changes even to the proposal house written where I believe some changes need to be made in the wording. Um, but most important, what needs to be done as far as gathering, gathering data, it has to come from the, from, the, from the state legislature, which will require a sickle cell uh, trait registry which is what's needed. So the Health and Hospital Corporation cannot get information and um, because it's not provided. Then we have to, you have to talk about the private hospitals. Are they participating? But if you have a sickle, state, sickle cell uh, SCT registry or any registry with even sickle cell disease, where, where moving forward, um, the physician can keep track of that child and parents are aware and by the time they reach the um, the reproductive age, then, um, then you get the gen genetic counseling put in place. So we all talk about newborns, but I'm an immigrant. I, was, I came here from Jamaica in 1965. And so um, this city is a city of immigrants. It's an influx of immigrants. So we're, we're, we're putting everything within a framework of just um, um, newborns. But what about the new arrivals? The parents and what we have, kids who are now um, ship, um, flown in from different states who are now part of our public education system, flown in from Florida or Texas, wherever they came from, um, they should not be excluded from the, from the group. And also, sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait, it's not just a, um, a brown and, and, and black thing. There are Caucasians, Asians, 
and, and you, we're talking about the entire fabric of New York City. And so it's not just one community, it's the whole community of New York City that should be involved in this educational process. And until the education is in place, we're gonna keep having babies born with sickle cell trait. The average lifespan is 50 years, and it's been going on since um, the public law 92294, which was passed by the, by the, um, the um, it was public law passed by the uh, U.S. Congress and Senate. That's 52 years, nothing's been done. The importance of this law is to be the first one in the nation, in the nation, that deals with sickle cell trait and genetic testing and so on. And I'm here advocating for that because with this said, I now have a platform to take to other states and other legislatures so I can make my case to make sure to see if this could become a national, national debate more so than just a local issue because it's global and it's national, but more important, um, again, um, in five days, it will be second anniversary of my son's passing, and I had to deal with that and carry that burden. Why didn't I know? Could I have made a difference if I had known? And that is the trauma that I'm carrying. I am dealing with my two nieces and I understand it's scary and that's the reason that I said I have hope in New York City and I'm here to talk about it and testify and I understand as a nurse I'm a registered nurse as well so sorry for your loss and um, you can make the difference nationally and you have a friend here we're gonna make sure that people listen thank you thank you thank you for your testimony um, next, can we please call uh, Yadir Navarro? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Yadir Navarro. I'm a director for New York Blood Center. Thank you, Council Member Narcisse, uh, Council Member Shulman, and the City Council for your support of New York Blood Center and the Community Blood Supply. We appreciate the opportunity to support this important bill alongside three of our sickle cell awareness partners and are proud to serve the community with the highest quality blood and stem cell products over the last 60 years. NYBC has a world-renowned research institute known for its novel and innovative research positively impacting public health through the development of products, technologies, and services with a humanitarian impact. And we're home to the largest rare blood inventory serving patients worldwide. The needs of the sickle cell community go hands in hands with a robust and diverse blood supply. One in three African-American blood donors are a match for these patients. So here representation truly matters. Blood transfusions remain a critical treatment option for sickle cell disease, with nearly 90% receiving at least one transfusion by the age of 20. As part of this proposed bill, we're fully committed to our mission of collecting and providing precise match units for these patients, and we'll continue to provide education training and information in our blood donor outreach programs. Our researchers will continue to focus on hematological um, disorders and are involved in pursuing discovery science programs centered on the development of novel treatments and strategies including drugs and cell-based therapies for sickle cell patients. Currently, NYBC is in a blood emergency due to dangerously low blood supplies. The pandemic has devastated blood centers across the country and exposed the vulnerability of our nation's blood supply, showing the need for broad-scale awareness and increased donations as only 2% of the New York City population actively donate. New York Blood Center asks for your support of the proposed bill to provide the education and assistance needed to effectively support our sickle cell community. We also support the need for accessibility to genetic testing to aid in the public's ability to make better informed health and family planning decisions. A healthy and diverse blood supply is essential to the health of our sickle cell disease warriors. Therefore, we request the inclusion of education on the need for blood from all genetic makeups to ensure we have what is needed to endure this disease. Additional details were submitted online for your review, and thank you again to the Council on, um, excuse me, the Committee on Health and the Committee on Hospitals for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, could we please have Michael Landau speak? Thank you very much. I'd like to dedicate this, uh, my presentation to Josephine Sisa, a colleague of mine in Uganda who passed away three weeks ago from sickle cell. 
So, uh, Madam's Chairman, women, um, the, and esteemed committee members, my name is Michael Landau, Chairman of CTI Life Health and the founder of the CTI Foundation. Thank you for the opportunity of offering testimony to this very important piece of legislation. CTI Life Health has built a digital healthcare ecosystem focused on the world's underserved communities to democratize access to better patient experience in primary healthcare. We have started in Uganda, in Africa, where sickle cell is prevalent, and I was shocked by the lack of treatment, support, research in sickle cell, despite the overwhelming number of warrior births. Sickle cell is the epitome of inequality and inequity in healthcare. Sickle cell is a dual recessive gene that both parents need to possess the trait. Then there is the 25% Russian roulette chance of having a child with sickle cell. Ashkenazi Jews have a similar and even more devastating disease called Tay-Sachs, which has all but been eradicated because of the incredible efforts and leadership of Rabbi Eckstein of Dar Yisharim and similar organizations that ensured that potential parents get tested for the trait before marriage and having kids. It's all about testing for the genes and testing for the trait. And so what we, at CTI, we have built the Life Registry as well as multiple cartoons to create awareness and education around the disease and show its hereditary and that no stigma should be attached to the disease of sickle cell. It is critical that all people at risk, which is all people till the age of 45 or 50 or to whatever age people have children, uh, get tested for the trait and that the city legislature plays its part in ensuring that all the insurances will cover the cost of the genetic testing or regular testing. We have numerous resources available at, the, at our website, the CTI Foundation, and the, on our website for the Life Registry. In addition, we have developed an app, which I'd love to speak to you about, called Lifeblood, uh, which is available on the Google Play Store and in the Apple Store, which, which empowers patients with sickle cell testing, as well as blood type testing. And we have created several educational cartoons explaining the sickle cell that are available on our CTI YouTube channel. In addition, CTI has developed a unique way to be able to collect data, all the questions that you were, being, you were asking before about which facility can do what. We've built systems in so far in Africa, but we can build them here in New York very quickly and within weeks or months together with the department, with the health and hospital uh, organization, you can be seeing data instantly, visually, and that can be available for all of the sickle cell warriors themselves, their carers, their families, and we've built systems that really uh, are, are available. And so CTI Life Health and the CTI Foundation remain committed to eradicating all sickle cell births by 2030. And we look forward to finding collaborative paths for empowering the valiant sickle cell warriors of today with better access to knowledge and personalized healthcare and working together can with the city council and hopefully with others around the country and around the world to go and literally eradicate sickle cell by 2030 the same way that in our community, Tay-Sachs has pretty much been eradicated through knowledge and through uh, people caring. And that's the critical thing. And you're caring and you'll make the difference. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And all the panel, thank you for the work that you've been doing. And I'm looking forward to partnering with you to get um, going and making sure that we do the right thing by the people of not only New York City, but the world at the end, because we have to lead by example. Thank you. Uh, we have one more participant in this panel, so if you could remain seated very quickly. Um, could we please have Dr. Kasum Viswanathan on Zoom uh, participate? Uh, please wait until a member of our staff unmutes you and the sergeant at arms sets the timer. Thank you. Your time will begin. Thank you. Can you hear me? And yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Kusum Viswanathan. I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist. I'm right now the chief medical officer of One Brooklyn Health at Brookdale Hospital Medical Center, and also the director of pediatric hematology um, oncology and the comprehensive sickle cell program. I represent uh, today one Brooklyn Health's comprehensive sickle cell programs at Interfaith Medical Center and Brookdale Hospital Medical Center. Both programs are in Brooklyn and they have a long history of providing coordinated, family-centered and comprehensive medical and psychosocial care to children and adults with sickle cell disease for more than 50 years. 
As we all know, sickle cell disease is an inherited disease diagnosed at birth by newborn screening, and patients can have recurrent, unpredictable pain crises that require hospitalizations and narcotic pain medications, and they develop complications in organs like the lungs with acute chest syndrome, strokes leaving disabilities, silent strokes, gallstones, sudden enlargement of the spleen causing shock and death, enlarged heart, pulmonary hypertension, retinopathy of the eyes, avascular necrosis of the hips, kidney failure requiring dialysis, and tendency for severe infections, lug, leg ulcers, and priapism. So One Brooklyn Health has been offering comprehensive care. Um, and in fact, Interfaith was uh, part of the cooperative studies and started doing this in 1978 uh, from the NIH cooperative studies. So what do we do? We follow up newborn screening referrals, and New York State has been referring patients to us since 1975. We enroll them in the program. We do individualized pain, pain management programs, regular assessment for all of the end organ damage, and I won't repeat everything, including transcranial Doppler testing, infection management, transfusion therapy, hydroxyurea, disease-modifying treatments like crizanlizumab and voxelator, which were approved about three years ago, iron chelation therapy. We have referred 15 patients for a cure for bone marrow transplant, and uh, 14 of them were cured of the disease. Uh, we, we refer for, you know, and we do counseling and education. Um, some of, many of these programs we were able to also do because we had HIRSA grants starting in 1995, but these grants are very limited and they take into account a region, like only one or two grants for a whole region, and do not take into account that New York City has more patients than mm -hmm. even entire other states. Mm -hmm. So please wrap it up. Okay. Please try to wrap So I just want to say the tremendous strides have been made in uh, treating and preventing the complications of sickle cell disease in children, and 95% of children now reach the age of 18. However, adults with the most severe forms of disease have a very short, uh, much shorter lifespan, and the lack of access to high-quality comprehensive care explains the increased mortality rate, and many sickle cell programs lack funding for support services like social work and case management services, which makes patients end up in the emergency room for episodic care. So I want to end by saying, yes, we have participated in many clinical trials and have um, partnered with many community-based organizations to help our patients, but we support the proposal to conduct professional education and gene genetic screening and public outreach campaigns. Over the last 30 years, we've conducted numerous outreach and education activities to PTA schools, faith-based and community-based organizations, and we encourage people, particularly of uh, childbearing age and teenagers, to get tested or to absolutely know their status. In fact, many of our brochures say, know your status, know your, do you know your sickle cell? Status? Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Okay. So Thank I just you. You can send us, we can email us all the yes, rest of I it. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to this panel. You, you can uh, you can be seated now. Um, next, we'll be calling up uh, Marlene Smith Sotillo, Brendan Fay, Jason Kreitz, and Ginger Davis. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your names. Um, Marilyn Smith Sotillo, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant starts the clock. Thank you. Before you start, I have to remind everyone since we have to leave the room, so try to tidy it up for us. Thank you. I appreciate you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marilyn Smith Sotillo. I am the president and CEO for the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corp International. And I know that you guys have already talked about sickle cell, you know what it is how it impact you, so I'm not going to discuss all, all that again. I would just like to, today is a sad day for me, which as the young man said, 
my son passed away after we, I mean, we introduced the sickle cell bill in 2011, as Dr. Moulton was talking about, and he's not here today to see the progress that we have made so far with the sickle cell bill. So, I mean, I just want to ask you guys to support the bill. I'm not going to go into all the details. Just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could we please have Brendan Fay uh, speak? Sure. Uh, good morning. And uh, uh, thank you, council members, for this hearing. I've been here at uh, uh, other hearings in previous years. Um, I'm here. Um, I'm the spouse of Dr. Thomas Moulton. And it was from Tom that I learned about sickle cell. I was already engaged in HIV and AIDS awareness, and so many others. I was appalled at my own ignorance and silence and stigma around sickle cell. And when I would be going on a date with Tom, he said, I can't see you, I'm going to a funeral parlor. On our shelf, we have a book with the images of children that he cared for who died through the years. To me, they're beautiful New Yorkers whose debts were unnecessary and reflect, you know, our, our lack of New York care. I just want to say there's so much that, that we can do um, in this city, from the Department of Education to the Department of Corrections. Every school could have an awareness day. Posters, I look forward to the day when on our bus shelters and our trains there are posters about. I would like to see our city naming streets and tell the stories of the pioneering medical doctors, you know, like Dr. Doris Louise Weathers, you know, like Dr. Yvette Faye Francis McBurnett, who dedicated their, their lives to caring for people with sickle cell. Everywhere I've gone in every single council district, there are people waiting for leadership and action from this city and from Albany. Tom and others have gone up and testified, and they've got pittance compared with California that can give 15 million for their citizens with sickle cell. And other states, New York, it lags way behind. It's a disgrace. We need to do better. Today is a day of hope. When I saw a council member and I checked your bio, nurse, I said, oh my God, at last, someone that's not about a political career, but how to use the city. We can do better. New York can. And uh, today is, I, I urge you, of course, to pass the resolution. And I hope that every single one of the 51 council members enthusiastically signed up. I wish this place was packed with New Yorkers telling their stories. I was at the walk in Central Park, I, I apologize. And a beautiful community of New Yorkers with pictures of their loved ones and passionately working for change and hope and health care. Um, I'm, that's what I came here today for. Thanks very much. We can do it. Yes, we can. And um, as you said, the room to be packed, that's what was in my head. When I come in, I say something so important, but it seems like people don't know the importance of it because we are having babies, having babies with sickle cell, and for generations to come, we're going to suffer from that too. It's not, only, it's not cost effective, and we can do better as a city of New York. And I, I hear you. Thank yes. you. Okay, and I spoke to somebody I just want to say, from Rikers Island, the homeless shelters. I speak to people who are there too, and they say, yeah, thank you very much. I'm gonna keep on talking about it, it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Jason Kreitz, please go ahead. And you pronounced it correctly, thank you. Uh, so my name is Jason Kreitz, and I flew in at the request of the Sickle Cell Patient Network. So.
Well, that was unexpected, but, but maybe not. So. <coughs> so, but privacy and patient advocate, uh, spent 18 years at IBM where I uh, was fortunate to work on some pretty interesting projects, inventing some things that also led to some of the things that were part of uh, Watson Health. So part of what I'm advocating for is, is for every rare disease group to have their own registry uh, that is ethically compliant, that preserves the privacy of the patients and fixes some of the issues that we heard today around uh, lack of proper data. Because without proper data, we in, in structured in a way that we can submit to the FDA for clinical trials, we, we have the same issues that we heard today. But it has to be done in a way that's ethical, where the patient is at the center has full control and visibility of what's done with their data at all times, lock and stop, right? And some of the advances that the rare disease groups have had, specifically around registries, have really enabled additional resources to be brought to bear, uh, including uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, and educational materials. As well as, you know, when, when patients, I mean, when patients look like me, I, I get different resources when I show up in the ER. And if these patients have this information provided from their care providers as well as within the EMR, that is not that complicated for us to have, especially within you know, New York City. Uh, we can affect change for when these patients present to the ED. So there were, there were more prepared statements, but uh, uh, you know, that, that's really what I'm advocating for. And also want to give awareness that, that Florida is actually already signed into law uh, funding for registries and educations. And uh, obviously the political climate is vastly different in Florida, and that should serve as a wake-up call for New York and New York City that other states that, that aren't as progressive as New York uh, need, to, need to catch up. So I'm available for any, any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. And we're looking forward to continue working together. It's not just the hearing. I'm looking forward to work with all of you to collaborate to make sure that we address it once and for all. So thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Ginger Davis, please go ahead when, when the sergeant starts the clock. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Mayor Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine, the former chair of the Health Committee here at the City Council, who has kept up his support for sickle cell disease and requested this hearing. Thank you to Chair Member, uh, Chairwoman uh, Mercedes Narcisse and Liz Shulman and, and to your committees for doing this uh, proposed amendment to the health bill to include sickle cell uh, provider education, public education, genetic screening, and just kind of to echo things that have already been said. Um, CM um, Gomez wanted to know, should there be testing for everybody? The answer is yes, emphatically. People should not be finding out during a pregnancy or after a child is born and a the, and the newborn screening comes back positive for trait or disease to hear about sickle cell. People should know so they can make informed choices. And like our associate Michael Lando said, people knowing that they have the trait and making informed choices about having children, um, whether they stay together a couple or not, can eradicate over time this disease. And that's something that our organization, the Sickle Cell Thalassemia Patient Network, and all the other sickle cell CBOs across this country and around the world want to do. We want to see the ends of the suffering. It is so vitally important that this legislation get passed that the whole city council 51 members support it because the impact continue after 12 years of you know in introducing legislation to the state uh, to give us money to, to build comprehensive treatment centers across the state. It has remained dead on the floor. The money that we ask for has been gutted and for what's left over, we can't really do or be successful at what we're trying to accomplish, like the state of California, to provide comprehensive care throughout all life stages. Right now, all we have is pediatric care. It's still being treated as a pediatric disease, and we are losing lives 
after our young people transition out of pediatrics into adult care because the emergency room becomes their primary rather than a cohort of trained physicians, multidisciplinary, keeping a person healthy, keeping them out of the ER. Not only that, the impact to Medicaid and Medicare, which we constantly address in our legislation, we can prove and we have the data. And Jason and Michael and their companies to help us uh, emphatically show that comprehensive care not only will save lives, improve the quality of, of, of our community, but lessen the impact to Medicaid and Medicare and take our families out of poverty because we are living in abject poverty it, the way the system is now. So thank you very much for this legislation. Anything that you need us to do, we will be here for. And I also want to say that all of our organizations, every, every member of our staff is HIPAA certified, uh, our Project ECHO trained, and we are able to do provider training as well as the healthcare professionals. And our organization should not be left out of any process in this bill when it comes to, from provider education to public education, genetic screening and counseling, we should be there every step with the professionals. Thank you. I thank you. And yes, we do need comprehensive treatment everywhere for all level, not just newborn. And I'm in, I'm in, agreement, I'm in agreement with you. And um, people have to have information so they can make informed decisions for themselves and their family. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony, and thank you to the entire panel for contributing. Uh, we will now be calling um, a Zoom panel. Um, I believe that um, Ms. Candice Deller, Chanel Rice Purnell, and Mabak Tiam, uh, again, I apologize if I mispronounced your names, uh, we call you to the next Zoom panel. In addition, we ask Gwen Lewis, Gwendolyn Lewis, and Zuliet Salman. Uh, to also participate in the panel if they are in attendance, um, but I don't know if they are. Um, in that case, um, Candace Deller, uh, when the sergeant starts the clock, please feel free to start. Your time will begin. My name is Candace Deller, and I have sickle cell disease. My mother has the trait my father stated that he didn't have the trait and um, not because he didn't want to be honest, but because he was not educated, he did have the trait. I am married and my husband does not have the trait, but I have two sons that have the trait. So 22 years ago, I founded Candace's Sickle Cell Fund Incorporated. We're a nonprofit organization in the Bronx. We educate people about sickle cell disease, and even though we do not have legislative pass, we do the best that we can to give a patient with sickle cell disease quality of life. And what that means is that we provide scholarships. We've given out over $100,000. We provide massages for patients who are constantly in pain and need a break. We send families to Great Adventure we send families to Sesame Place to make people feel normal for the day or for the week. Whatever it is that we can do, we try to provide assistance to the families because there's not enough funding and there's not enough support. And so throughout all the boroughs, if patients are sent to us, we make them feel special. We provide patients with catered meals after they come in, out of the hospital because a lot of times patients do not come home well. We are in the hospital for weeks and still come home and have to attend to our families and are not well still. So we provide a week of catered meals for families to get back on their feet. While we're waiting for legislation to be passed, Time please expired. utilize our service and allow us to educate. We go into the schools, we raise awareness, we talk about trait testing, um, utilize your CBOs. All of our CBOs that have been mentioned today work together. Please utilize us and allow us to make a difference while we're still waiting for legislative to be passed. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next, can we please have Chanel Rice Purnell? 
Your time will begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. My name is Chanel Rice Purnell. I um, was diagnosed with sickle cell at birth. Um, I currently attend uh, Interfaith Medical Center, which is part of One Brooklyn Health um, Sickle Cell Clinic. I'm here to advocate for the bill as well as advocating for the reform of emergency room um, protocols across New York City. I am an adult living with sickle cell disease and oftentimes I find that there is little to no transition for pediatric patients going into adulthood. Um, primary care doctors pretty much just do away with learning about sickle cell disease and often refer to us to go to hematologists. And there are different, there's very like very, um, it's very difficult finding hematologists that specialize in sickle cell across New York City. So oftentimes the programs that we do have do see pediatrics through on through adulthood and often adults utilize their emergency rooms as a form of um, primary care doctor to get effective um, and equi equitable um, care. So I am advocating for a, a reform of hospital emergency room protocols across the board. Oftentimes, sickle cell patients are stigmatized going into the hospitals. Um, you know, they're often labeled as drug seeking. They're not able to get medication, which prolongs care, leads to blood transfusion, so on and so forth. Um, so if we can kind of like work towards advocacy um, in hospitals and emergency rooms uh, with sickle cell disease, I think that would be a great form of change and also um, work towards adult treatment with sickle cell because we are out here um, and oftentimes we aren't counted in the numbers because there's no one, you know, um, looking at us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. appreciate your time. Looking forward to continue the work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Mabak Thiam, please feel free to start as soon as the sergeant starts the clock. Your time will begin. Hello everyone, I'm sorry. My name is Mbaka Jam. I'm the housing and the health community organizer at Sydney Center for the Independence of the Disabled. So I'm here also to see to say that I'm happy and excited about the work that you are doing in order to help people with dis disability. Uh, disabilities, especially people with uh, sickle cell. So Sydney is an organization that uh, that is a voice for folks with disabilities since 1978. We are part of the Independent Living Centers Movement, a national network of grassroots and community-based organizations that enhance opportunities for all people with disabilities to direct their own life. I'm here to tes testify and support the bill into 96968A for a professional education and program and public outreach campaign regarding the sickle cell. I will put emphasis on bringing awareness about the program for people with disability and their family members, as well as people with chronic disease. Uh, I didn't hear about uh, uh, outreach strategies that will be led in order to help folks who are minority groups, in order to, 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 to help people who are not in the mainstream so i really look forward to see uh, strategies and plans that will help people see themselves in the program and be able also to take advantage of it and uh, recover from uh, from uh, uh, be taken care of uh, so i'm i'm here i will uh, draft my uh, my testimony and submit it but i just wanted to make sure that folks with disability are uh, uh, away of the program and also uh, strat uh, there is uh, strategies, outreach strategies that will help them hear the message. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, at this point, um, I would like to um, ask if there is anyone in the room or on Zoom who has not yet had the opportunity to testify and would like to do so. And if so, please, uh, please identify yourself and state your name if you would like to participate. Okay. 
Um, hearing nothing, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record for up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and seeing no one else, um, I believe that we have concluded public testimony for this hearing, Chair. So first, I wanna say thank you. I'm looking forward for us to continue partnering to make sure that once and for all that we address um, the sickle cell trait and disease in our city. And um, since we're the capital of the world, let's lead by example. So um, you see what's, what's in front of us right now is um, to consider the intro 968A and, um, the, and the pre-considered resolution that we have as well. Before I conclude every, uh, everything, I wanna say thank you to all the team, Rhea, that's here um, keeping up and trying to get the best um, out of our city. Address the prevent, I mean, preventive care is the best way to go. So I wanna say thank you to, our, um, to my staff, uh, Frank Shea, of course, Deputy Chief of Staff, and my Chief of Staff, Saye Joseph, and the ledge person that really pushing forward to make sure that we get um, the health care, the bills to pass, and making sure that we address the inequities once and for all. Our policy analyst, Manu Butt, thank you. And um, to the finance analyst, Julia uh, Friedenberg, of course, James Hu and Alicia Miranda for their work on this issue. And everyone, everyone that come out, and h, &H thank you. Um, um, DOHMH, thank you, and everyone that participate and give their, um, from their heart, their testimony from their heart. Um, we will address this, and um, we'll continue to fight with this. And I hope when I do call for you, you're not only bringing yourself, you bring all the team around you, and um, something so important like this, we should have the crowd waiting. But um, yes, but we may be a few but the difference is gonna be made in New York City and for the world to see. So thank you and God bless you all and um, looking forward. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs>